my great pleasure shortly to introduce Professor Anne Townes, our uh, speaker this evening, and also Professor Conway uh, in the front here, who will um, speak as a respondent to uh, Professor Townes' remarks. Uh, if you stay with us till seven o'clock, there is a, a drinks reception outside. But if you leave early, you're not allowed to steal a bottle on your way out. <laughs> that would be mean. Uh, I'm not trying to give you any ideas there. Um, so, um, Anne Towns is the, the first, uh, the inaugural recipient of a prize at the International Studies Association um, in the Diplomatic Studies section, which uh, SOAS is part of, uh, in the name of uh, Berta Lutz. And this lecture, which I think will now become an annual lecture of the prize winners, uh, is designed to uh, cut a long story short to make Berta Lutz as well known as Eleanor Roosevelt. Because uh, whereas uh, Eleanor Roosevelt did many, many extraordinary things uh, in the interests of, uh, of, of feminism at home and abroad, um, at the end of the day, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, although it has, uh, has achieved the status of customary international law, um, was in a General Assembly document and much to the relief of many civil servants, didn't have the binding force of law. Uh, however, uh, Article 8 of the UN Charter, which specifies gender equality in the UN and by extension much more widely, of course does have uh, legal force in the UN system. And as a result of the work of uh, predecessors, uh, predecessor generations of students at CISD, we uncovered the hidden story that uh, the single most important reason why there is gender equality in the UN Charter is because of a Brazilian diplomat, uh, Berta Lutz, who was sent by her government to achieve gender equality in the negotiations of the UN Charter in 1945 at San Francisco. And uh, we have all felt this is a rather important fact and indeed uh, the diplomatic corps of Brazil had forgotten. Uh, many of uh, 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 people in political circles in Brazil had forgotten. And indeed, if you ask any professor, and even feminist professors, the question, how did gender equality get into the charter? Uh, people will go, um, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, question mark. And we thought, well, let's see if we can endow a, a prize um, at the International Studies Association in the name of Bertha Lutz. And this will start to uh, proselytize the, the idea of who is Bertolitz, what did she do, why is she important, and so forth. And the prize is for uh, writing on women in diplomacy. Uh, and that, of course, has come a long way since uh, uh, Bertolitz. Now we have some states with feminist foreign policies. Um, uh, and a long way since the conversation that Lutz records in her memoirs where she went to San Francisco and met with the women delegates from the United Kingdom and the United States who informed her that she should not ask for anything as vulgar as gender equality in the Charter and be content with the understanding that men meant women. <laughs> and as she said at the time and in, in the conference, men has never meant women and it won't now, um, and went on with her campaign. So that was the idea for the prize, and I'm uh, absolutely delighted that the prize worked so well that we have Anne Towns here with us today. Um, Anne Towns is Professor in Political Science at the University of uh, Gothenburg. Uh, she is the PI, lead, Research Leader on the Gender and Diplomacy uh, Programme of the very, uh, is a very prestigious Wallenberg Academy Fellow. Um, in addition to her small honour um, with respect to the Bertolitz Prize, the Wallenberg Academy uh, Fellowship, I think, runs into very large sums of money beyond the reaches of, of the centre. Um, and received her PhD in political science uh, and feminist studies at the University of Minnesota in 2004, has served as associate editor of the International Studies, studies Quarterly, um, and a member of the editorial boards of uh, Cambridge Studies in Gender and Politics, International Studies Review, uh, and Politics uh, and International Politics. 
She has also served on various sections and committees, indeed, of the International Studies Association. Her research centres around questions of norms, hierarchies and resistance in international politics, usually with a focus on gender. She is the author of Women and States, Norms and Hierarchies in International Society and editor of Gendering Diplomacy and International Negotiation. Her articles have been published in journals such as International Organization and the European Journal of International Relations. Her work has received multiple awards from sections within the International Studies Association and the American Political Science Association. As principal investigator of the GenDIP program and research group, she is currently conducting a large research project on gender dynamics in diplomacy, an, inter an interstate institution that has long been dominated by men, but where more women have entered within the past decade. And after she has uh, concluded her remarks, the respondent will be uh, our own Marissa Conway, who founded the Centre for Feminist Foreign Policy in London, who also now has a German branch, uh, after graduating in Gender Studies uh, from SOAS. And I'm pleased to say that Gender, SOAS and G Gender Studies and the Diplomacy section are now combined in SOAS's School of International Studies. So without more ado, uh, and with another reminder to hang on for the drinks, can I hand over to Anne? Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, thank you. And thank you to Dr. Plash and for the Center of International Studies and Diplomacy for inviting me here. And thank you to all of you for coming here on a Monday night to listen. It's my privilege really to be here to get to talk about the, this research program, which is a few years in. So we're kind of midway, I think, in terms of we've started asking a bunch of questions. We don't really have all the answers, but I'll try to tell you why those questions are so important, why we think they're so interesting, and give you some answers, I think, to some of the questions, at least. So this evening, I'll tell you a bit about what makes gender and diplomacy an interesting research arena. Like, why is this an area that needs research? Also, how we at GenDip, how we approach this research problem and what we're doing, you know, talking a little bit about the fact that we were studying what diplomats do, people that are officially designated as representatives of states. So not diplomacy in the kind of widest sense, right, but in a narrow, formal sense, the diplomats that do the diplomatic work of states. Right? And then hopefully I'll get to some of the findings and the analyses that we've done at the end. I have my, I see there's no clock here, so I can't really time myself, but I have my cell phone, so I'll try to keep this within the 40 to 45 minutes that I was allotted. So I'll skip this. Let me tell you a bit about the GenDIP research program, for starters, before we get to the questions and what it's actually about. So I'm the PI, then, of this program, Gender and Diplomacy Research Program, at the University of Gothenburg, which is now three years in the making. At this point, it's a six-year program. I have funding for six years. I'm hoping to extend that. So I'm, you know, in addition to the grants we have already, we're applying for more. So hopefully this will be something that's ongoing and that will grow with time, right? So my aim is to extend this beyond what the group that we have now. So the program consists of this core small research group with me. There are two associate professors at the University of Gothenburg, a PhD student, range of master's students, we have research assistants, we have visiting scholars. If there's anyone interested that's working on gender and diplomacy, you're more than welcome to apply to see if you can stay with us for a bit and do research at Gothenburg. Um, we do a range of different kinds of research on diplomats. We're putting together a database, for instance, on ambassador appointments. We're assembling data on where women and men are in specific ministries from foreign affairs. We do interviews, we have retrieval of archival materials, we do some observations. So it's kind of a broad range of data and approaches to studying gender and diplomacy. There's also a GenDIP research network. So GenDIP is trying to be a hub between, because there's popping up more and more 
scholars around the world that are studying gender and diplomacy now. So we're trying to be kind of a hub for that. So if any of you are working on gender and diplomacy, I would also encourage you to get in touch to see if you can be part of the network. We have ongoing, we have panels, sections, there are workshops and so forth. So it's a way to bring scholars together, right? So that there can be some dynamic among those of us that are working on this kind of new topic. Um, we're launching a listserv in the next month or so too. So if you're interested in the topic too, you can sign up for that and you'll be part of the, in the loop kind of other things that are ongoing. Um, so far we have, you know, a range of publications, but the major publications haven't really come out yet. So we have kind of some agenda setting pieces. So I have a book, Palgrave, an edited volume in their diplomacy series that's on gendering diplomacy and international negotiation, which is accompanied by an article in the International Feminist Journal of Politics that's trying to set the agenda for why we should study this stuff, and why it's so important. So let me get to that, like what the research challenge is. So diplomacy, as you probably well aware, is a basic institution of international politics. I mean, on the one hand, we have military and the use of force, and then there's diplomacy as the interaction between states by peaceful means, right? With its infrastructure then of embassies, diplomats, and so forth. Um, but whereas there's an enormous literature on gender in the military, and we know a lot about the gender dynamics of the military, there's so much less on diplomacy. Right? There's virtually nothing at all until very recently, which is really odd, right? Because diplomacy, like the military, has a very male-dominated history. Ministries for Foreign Affairs have been much more male-dominated than most other state institutions. So when state office opened for women in the early 20th century, there were generally two exceptions where women could not enter, right? There was diplomacy on the one hand and military in the military on the other hand. And just like the military, diplomacy has been very slow to open up to women. They, some states started up opening up their diplomatic training programs for women in the around 1918 Brazil, for instance, in the 1920s. The UK, Sweden, and other states did not do so until 1946. Okay, many states did so even later, well into the 60s. And many states, when they opened up for women, they pla placed new barriers for women. So they placed a marriage ban specifically on women diplomats. So whereas male diplomats were expected to marry, right, and the diplomatic spouse was expected to travel with the male diplomat and do unpaid labor, right, that she was supposed to host these receptions and hold dinners and be the informal eyes and ears of her husband, female diplomats weren't allowed to marry at all. If they married, they had to leave the profession. So it's a very unequal kind of professional field for male and female diplomats. That marriage ban was not lifted until the early 1970s. Okay, I think Australia might have been first in 1969 or something like that. Some southern states n never had such a ban. Okay, so Turkey never had a marriage ban, for instance. It's not as if every state had them, but from what I've seen so far, many western states had bans on women, okay, that women were not allowed to marry. So, they were lifted late in the 1970s, and it's not really until the 19, late, mid to late 1990s, last two decades or so, that we see a lot more women in larger numbers entering into diplomacy. Some ministries of foreign affairs, like Sweden and the UK, for instance, have had gender parity since the 1990s. Right? Others are seeing dramatic increases now. So there are campaigns, active recruitment of women into career diplomacy in a range of states. Japan, United Arab Emirates, right, and a range of other places are trying actively to recruit more female diplomats. So what we have then is we have an institution that's been very heavily male dominated for a long time, right? And then we have a relatively quick surge of women in the last two decades, especially in some ministries from foreign affairs. We also have some teeny tiny movement towards opening up space for transgender persons in diplomacy. That's not exactly a huge movement, but it's happening, right? And we know from prior gender scholarship that institutions that have been male dominated, right, they tend to become masculinized, right? It smears off, like it matters, right? Whether those are designated male or in an institution or female and so forth. We also know that when there are rapid changes in the gender makeup of institutions, all these complex adjustments have to be made. 
new gender patterns might emerge. Right? So I think at this moment, it gives us an excellent opportunity to ask some very basic questions about gender in diplomacy. So the research challenge, I think, for all of us that are interested in this, is really an opportunity, right? That there is so little scholarship on gender and diplomacy in political science in particular. So to be sure, there's a thriving literature in diplomatic history. In the field of history, there is quite a bit of work. But on the contemporary era and within international relations or, or political science, there is virtually nothing. Right? Since I started this program, a few people have started doing work on this, so there will be more work coming out. But there's really nothing as of yet. So we still know next to nothing about how gender works kind of in contemporary diplomacy. So the field is wide open for people to ask questions, ranging from undergrads to master students, right, and, and other parts of the field. So one of the main challenges that I found myself with is basically where to start, right? I mean, usually when you enter into kind of a research arena, there's an ongoing conversation and you can fit yourself into it. But here, in a sense, right, there's, that, there's nothing on diplomacy. So what kinds of questions do you ask first? What do you do? How do I approach this field? Right? To what debates in IR and gender studies more broadly do I address these questions? Right? I'm still wondering a bit. <laughs> I'm situating this work, I think, kind of closely then, for given reasons, within diplomatic studies, within international relations. And diplomatic studies, as you might know, has recently become a very thriving field within IR, not least because of the so-called practice turn, which you might have heard of also, with its attention to the everyday, to the mundane, mundane and embodied practices of actors at the micro level. So looking at what actors and diplomats do in the everyday, right? Like how international politics is done on the ground level. This practice turn has obvious parallels in the longer tradition of feminist IR scholarship, which has also focused on the micro level, on the mundane, on embodied practices, and in the, also in the critical tradition of, in IR more generally. So my project then shares many points of departure with this micro turn or the turn to the local, the practice turn. I think it's absolutely necessary to look at how diplomacy is practiced in the everyday on the ground, right? But that said, I also, you know, place myself in that tradition with a couple of reservations. And first, I think there's a danger in some practice turn and some kind of local turn or micro turn oriented work to become myopic at times. Because in focusing on the micro, you sometimes lose track of broader patterns, the potential at least, broader patterns across time and space, right? So I think there's a need also to zoom out a bit, to try to piece together analyses to say something bigger, right? A bigger picture across somewhat, somewhat larger swaths of time and space. And second, I think in the turn to the micro, there's a tendency in each study to focus on one kind of action, one side of practice. So we have studies that are on tweeting in diplomacy, or the use of track changes in documents in diplomacy, on negotiation styles, on emotional labor, and so forth, right? And those, I think this is wonderful, because this produces really carefully crafted studies that dr drill very deeply into one set of practices within diplomacy. But there's a danger, I think, again, in compartmentalizing what diplomacy is into individualized and specific practices, right? So that we end up with very fragmented knowledge, right? Unless we make some connect attempt to connect all these practices and trying to think of them together in some way. So my aim then is to see whether and how all these a multitude of different kinds of gendered practices might cohere and what each practice might mean in the context of others. I'm not there yet, so unfortunately I can't give you that big picture <laughs> answer, but that's the aim of the project, is to try and think, of, like be very careful and specific, but yet try to think of how these practices fit together, right, into broader patterns. So much like Sylvia Lechner and Mervyn Frost, if you've seen their recent engagement with the practice turn, I prefer to work with the concept of an institution in other words, a broader and possibly more coherent context that provides a meaningful framework for interaction, right? So in doing that, instead of calling it kind of practices, 
I'm attempting to understand gender in diplomacy in more systematic terms as some form of, I mean, it's unstable and it's in process, but it's still some sort of system of rules and norms rather than focusing on specific forms of action. Okay. So to try to get a grip on how gender works in diplomacy, then I think it's necessary to look at multiple dimensions and try to think of how they fit together. Gender, as you might know, is extraordinarily adaptive, right? It has a chameleon-like flexibility. It shifts in importance and effects from context to context, right? So my working assumption is that gender is dispersed across different forms of action. It operates in different ways, and yet we can't think of ways in which they hang together, structuring diplomacy in a way that make, enables us to think of it as an institution, something that coheres in some way. So to organize the research, then, I, I found the classic work of Joan Acker, if you know her, she's a, soci a feminist sociologist, really helpful as, as a start. And she has done work on, on gendered institutions. And I use the institution in, in two ways. On the one hand, as a you know, formal institution, an established formal organization with clear aims and rules, right, like an organization. But on the other hand, an institution can also be less formalized, but nonetheless sustained ongoing practices. Right? So it can be formal organizations like the Ministries of Foreign Affairs on the one hand, or it can be formalized interactions between diplomats, routinized interactions. Right? So diplomacy can be understood as a gendered institution, I think, in both of these ways. So I'm just going to go through this really quickly so you can see the different kinds of practices and different kinds of things we can look at when we talk about diplomacy as, an, as a gendered institution. So, in Acker's classic formulation, to say that an institution is gendered, and I'm going to quote for her, means that, quote, advantage and disadvantage, exploitation and control, action and emotion, meaning and identity are patterned through and in terms of a distinction between male and female, masculine and feminine, and also between masculinities or between femininities. So gender is not an addition to ongoing institutional processes conceived as gender neutral. Rather, gender is an integral part of those processes, which cannot be properly understood without an analysis of gender. So gender is part and parcel of what an institution is from this perspective. Right? It's also a process, and it's power laden. And within institutions, there are at least four interacting processes or dimensions that can be distinguished. Right? So, on the one hand, we can talk about hierarchical divisions of labor. Right? This refers to the locations in physical space and to formal organizations right? in terms of positions of power, positions of subordination. So this is pretty obvious, I think, even to casual observers. It doesn't take a lot of kind of gender the theoretical infrastructure to, to see this. Right? So we can ask very simple questions. Where are men and women and non-binary non persons, if there are any, right, in the formal posts of diplomacy? How many men and women are there in diplomacy? Where are they located within the ministries for foreign affairs, among ambassadors, in terms of positions of power? Right? Are there patterns in terms of where the men and women and non-binary folks are in diplomacy? Okay? Are men overrepresented in hardship positions and militarized postings? or women underrepresented in positions of power and prestige, as we might expect. Those are some basic questions we can ask. How has this changed over time? Second way to ask about diplomacy as a gendered institution is to look at symbols and images as, as those are constructed and reproduced within the institution. Okay? And these are symbols in, in the language of Acker, symbols and images that explain, express, reinforce, sometimes oppose the divisions of labor that we see in the first dimension here. So in diplomacy, we can ask questions about, for instance, um, how diplomacy is gendered in terms of how it's represented and talked about. How is the figure of the diplomat represented? Okay? In what ways has the male dominance of diplomacy manifested in masculinization of diplomacy in the sense of what kinds, what kinds of adjectives, what kinds of terms, what kind of attributes that we attribute to the diplomat? Right. We can also ask questions about whether and what kinds of symbolic roles women and men play as diplomats and ambassadors and so forth. So this is a whole terrain of research questions here to be asked too about gender, rhetoric, symbolic representation. 
third, the third dimension of institutions are interactions and relations, right? Between women, women and men, between women and women, between men and men, and so forth, right? Including all those patterns that enact dominance and submission. So here we're getting to the actual practices, like how the behavior actions, right? Acker mentions things like conversation analysis, showing how gender is expressed in things like interruptions, turn-taking at meetings, who listens to whom, who gets to talk for how long, who gets reinforced when they're speaking, and so, so forth, right? And the flow of the ordinary everyday of, of doing diplomacy. I would add that interactions can also be thought of in terms of gendered social networks, right? I mean, just a classic, there's a lot of research in other arenas on kind of old boys' networks versus women's friendships, right? Those are kind of the stereotypical networks that, that tend to emerge in other institutions. And those are questions, again, they're excellent to pose to diplomacy. Diplomacy is all about relations and networks, right? That's at the center of what diplomacy is. So we can ask very basic questions here, too, about the gendered character, kind of, of these interactions and relations. And then fourth and finally, we can ask questions about identities of those that occupy, of, of diplomats, right? Those that, that become the agents of diplomacy. So Acker says that these processes help to produce gendered components of individual identity, which may include consciousness of the existence of the first three, right? Are diplomats gender conscious? That's a very basic question to ask about this. And here I would say it depends. Many are not at all. Some are very, right? Um, but it can also have to do with things like how you perform gender. Right, in your choice of clothes, what does it mean to be a diplomat if you're a woman or a man in terms of behavioralism or behaviors, I mean, language, the presentation of self, right? You can ask questions about the gender components of this, right? How do they understand appropriate language use? How do they resist and maneuver gender norms and scripts and so forth? So if we think about all these four dimensions together, I find that a very helpful kind of initial entry into, since we don't know much about diplomacy at all, I think we need to do all of these things, right? And we need to try to think about them together. How do these things work? How do they reinforce one another, right? Rather than fo focusing on one thing or the other, because then we tend to get a distorted, too narrow a view, right? And it might also seem sometimes that gender might not matter that much if you just focus on one little sliver. Right? But to me, I think that the, the important thing is looking at like across all these different ways of, of reproducing gender. Right? Like, what is the what's what's the systematic story here? So, for the rest of this talk now, oh, I should say also that one, you know. I don't just here look at like male, female, the nexus of the male masculinities and femininities, right? There are other hierarchies that are at work always when, when we do gender analyses. So there's an intersection obviously with things like racial hierarchies, with hierarchies of sexuality, right? With hierarchies of class and so forth. So those enter into the analysis, but I can't say exactly in what way systematically yet because I'm not far along in the analysis to give you kind of a, I'm doing it exactly this way, right? But in the, I mean, in the analysis, as, as they emerge, those components are always part and parcel of the analyses. And then I also want to say that I highlight here, and I think this is what makes this novel, perhaps, for, for gender scholars, is the importance of looking at international hierarchies in the constitution of gender in practice. Okay? So in what ways do kind of hierarchies between states, right? how does that matter for how gender is performed by diplomats, okay? Because it's not the same thing, right, to be a female ambassador representing the U.S. as it is to be a female ambassador representing St. Kitts and Nevis, okay? You do femininities in a different way. Your, your gender performance is going to look different, right, because of these internationalized hierarchies. So that's what I'm, like, the nexus kind of between international hierarchy and gender, that's my primary one with the other hierarchies entering in, okay? So the rest of the talk now, I'm sorry to start with a drier, kind of more abstract theoretical baggage, but just to give you a sense of how we're entering into the project, I will now try to turn to some of the findings and some of the more concrete stuff, like what kinds of patterns do we see then? And I will primarily, because we have, we have you know, done these in order, so we start with the 
theoretically less interesting, but no less important, number one, right? Where are the men and women in diplomacy? We need to know this. How many ambassadors are women in the world, right? So we've done some work on that, also done some work on language, symbols, and images. So I'll talk primarily about those two, and then I'll give you some hints of where we are with the interactions and the identities. But that's, that's work that we're still doing. So I don't have findings there yet to share with you. Um, so on turning to the hierarchical divisions of labor within diplomacy, when we talk about diplomacy, or talk about divisions of labor, right? We have done this simple, theoretically not so interesting, right, but still necessary and very time consuming, I might say, mapping of where men and women are placed in terms of the formal positions of diplomacy. One part of this, again, concerns where men, men and women are at within individual ministries of foreign affairs. So there's one person in the project that does work on the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs to look at what's happened as lots of women have come in, right? She's seeing that there's also very gendered patterns within the organization, right? That women tend to cluster kind of in the more humanitarian offices, foreign aid and so forth. Men tend to cluster in securities and political affairs, right? So not surprising, but you see it. And from what it might seem, it might seem also that the more women there are initially, the bigger the gender patterns are, right? Those might disappear over time, but not yet. But then, you know, we do collaborations with, with scholars around the world. They're working on, again, like Indonesia, Japan, India, Brazil, Turkey, right, the US. So those are scholars in the network and not in the core. They're looking at this. So that, then these are primarily public administration types of folks. Right? So that's one piece of the division of labor. The other piece that I'm very interested in and that we've done some work on is patterns and postings. And to get to those, I mean, the data that's available or that we can at least assemble has to do with ambassador postings. So how many women ambassadors are there and where do they get posted? What states post women ambassadors and where do they get posted to? So we put together a database on the postings of 2014, where all the ambassadors that were, it wasn't necessarily the year they were posted, but they were in a post in 2014, which is soon to be complete. I think it's roughly somewhere between 9,000 and 10,000 people. So it's a lot of work. And we, you have to go through each Ministry for Foreign Affairs. There's no ready database. You have to go through each individual ambassador and see if that person is, you get either a Mr. or a Ms., right? You're either Her Excellence or Excellency or His Excellence, right? So there's a binary set up and we have to go through each and every one to see, right? So we've now, with lots of research assistance, almost done with 2014, we're now beginning with 2019, but we do have some data, so we can say something about the numbers. And remember, ambassadors, an ambassador is kind of the apex of the diplomatic career, so this is the top posting, which means that there are a lot more women at the lower levels, okay? So this is at the top level. So in 2014, then, there were 15% women ambassadors. I've written female ambassadors, which is kind of incorrect. Women ambassadors, I should say, or designated women ambassadors by sending state. So 85% of ambassadors still are men, right? So at the top level, it's not as if there's been a huge breakthrough yet. But the ratio of women ambassadors varies quite a bit, as you can see here, right? I don't think it's a huge surprise. Nordic countries, 35%, right? But I think you should also note that if we look to Europe, if we exclude the Nordic states, right, Europe is slightly less than average, and Europe does worse right, than Africa and South America. So it's not as if Europe has tons more women diplomats than other states of other regions of the world. And we see quite a bit of variations within each region as well. Right? So Colombia has more than 30% women ambassadors. The Philippines has more than 30%. So they have as many as Denmark, right? So there's also variation within them. So, you know, this is just rough, just to give a rough sense, right? The question of why the variation still remains to be answered, but that's what all these folks that are looking at individual ministries for foreign affairs, that's what they're doing. And the next question we can look at is where are they sent? 
right? And if you note North America, which is Canada, US, and Mexico, is 29, they send 29% women ambassadors, but they receive only 16% on average. And the United States, if we look at the US, receives 6%, even though the US sends more than 30%, right? So we see that this isn't quite, it doesn't look exactly the same. It's not re entirely reciprocal. So then we can start asking questions, why might that be? Hmm, what's so special about the US, right? Well, it's a hub of international power, right? And when we look at, if we, you know, what we did is we ranked states according to military expenditure and according to the size of economy and a bunch of other indicators to look at, like, what are the kind of, hubs of power in the world, right? And how can we rank states? We see that, you know, in the bottom half, there's no real difference. It's not as if women end up in the poorest, least powerful states, right? But when we look at the very top, the DC, London, Paris, Berlin, Moscow, there are very few women there, right? So it's something akin to a glass ceiling. So I'm blowing bubbles now to drink. So we're seeing that like, at the very center of international power and prestige, there are not very many women diplomats or women ambassadors, okay? Which means then that that helps reproduce this idea, right? That international, the, the central power in international politics is still, right, man, it's held by men, right? And in that sense, masculinized, in the sense that it still becomes associated with men, right? And whether you get posted to DC or not, of course, has most to do with what's going on in your home ministry for foreign affairs. That's power battles that like women and men are fight, duking out right, in their home ministries. But they clearly look similar across the world since there are very few states that consistently send women ambassadors to, to, to DC. And interestingly, out of the states, when I was in DC last year to do f field work, Many of the women that were there, it was about 6% or 7% women ambassadors, right? And many of the women that were there represented a very small island, like the Caribbean states, right? 30% of the women that were there were representing Muslim majority states, okay? So it's not either as if it's, again, like European states sending their ambassadors to the US, right? So I, there's a lot here, I think, to unpack and to look more closely at it. And I think the main takeaway, if we're interested in international hierarchies, is this is another way in international politics that power is masculinized, right? that the centers of power are still dominated by men. OK. So lots of questions then. We're just beginning to scratch the surface. Lots of questions can be asked about the formal positions of power. Right? We have MA students, again, asking a range of other questions. Are women less likely to be posted to militarized contexts? Among donor states, is there a division of labor, so to speak, between men and women, with m women more likely to end up in foreign aid positions, right? Do women ambassadors ever serve a symbolic function, posted to signal that the sen sending state is so-called progressive or modern, right? There are all kinds of questions to be asked about, about like, why these few women that are being posted, why are they being posted where they're posted, right? But then, so there's a set of questions then about the formal positions of diplomacy. This is not, I think, from my, this is not what I find most animating. I think we need this, we need this data. We need to see this black and white. We need to know these basics, right? But it's, theoretically, it's not the most kind of stimulating work. It's not where my heart is really either. So I think then, like, what I find more interesting is kind of when we get into, you know, how gender is performed, done, represented, right? That's where we find much more interesting stuff to look at. So the second way then to approach this, if we use Joan Acker's um, way of cutting into institutions, is to look at whether and how diplomacy and the figure of the diplomat are gendered rhetorically in language, okay? So we can ask that question, right? like how is diplomacy gendered symbolically and in language? Let me see how much time I have here. Okay. Um, and the two most important texts addressing this question today, there's a chapter by Cynthia Enlow that you might be aware of her, right? She wrote this iconic book from 1990, Banana Speeches and Bases. 
And then there's a chapter by Ivor Newman. He was a professor at LSE, right, that in his book At Home with the Diplomats. So he has a chapter where he addresses kind of masculinities, femininities, and diplomacy. And both of them agree that diplomacy is masculinized and that the diplomat is figuratively, if not always literally, a man. Right? So in those chapter remains the classic academic treatment of this question. And she writes about the late 1980s that she, she presents diplomacy as a very male world, guided by norms of masculinity inhabited by men. And she writes, quote, that men are seen as having the skills and resources that the government needs if its international status is to be enhanced. They are presumed to be the diplomats, end of quote. And then she writes a lot about how women then are channeled into these informal roles as wives and kind of support workers that don't get recognized in diplomacy. Right? Newman comes to a similar conclusion, but he does something else in his work. He distinguishes between three different masculinities that work in diplomacy that he calls the bourgeois, petit bourgeois, petit bourgeois, and rebel masculinities. But he's very clear also that the diplomat is scripted male, right? which leads to, quote, an inherent tension between the status as women and diplomat, end of quote. So when I started this program and this project, um, I had this idea about the masculinization of diplomacy as a premise. So when the Vallenberg Foundation, when they wrote a cover piece, like they wrote an article about my pro project, the title of that article is Women Diplomats Clash Against Masculinity Norms. I assumed that this was the case. But then I started reading more, because I'm not a diplomacy scholar, right? So I started reading more widely about diplomacy, and particularly in US media circles, right? In US foreign policy circles, and how they represent diplomacy. And I became much less sure that diplomacy is so securely masculinized, even if it's still dominated by men, okay? So let me give you an illustration. One of the first instances that gave me pause and that made me think that there's something else going on here. And that's the debate which you might have seen, it's a decade old now, but between Robert Kagan and Perry Khanna on the strategic cultures of the US and Europe after the Cold War. Okay, okay so I'm, hold on, I need my, the rest of my notes. Sorry, I lost half of them in my folder. All right, here we go. So, in 2002, Robert Kagan right, published an essay called Power and Weakness, which you might have read, which sparked a great deal of debate on both sides of the Atlantic. The essay, as you know, might, or might know, set out to contrast the post-Cold War strate strategic cultures of the US and Europe, and to claim that their distinctive strategic dispositions um, derive from the relative power positions. So Europe is weak, and the United States is strong. So Europe is forced to use, in his words, use international law and diplomacy, whereas the US can rely on military force, right? So it's a familiar kind of depiction of what the US and Europe is strategically in international affairs. To make this point, Kagan drew on some familiar gender metaphors. So equating Europe with a woman and the US with a man, right? So in an infamous passage, he claimed that, and I'll, I'll, that on major strategic and international questions today, Americans are from Mars and Europeans from Venus, end of quote. So to Kagan then, Europe's reliance on diplomacy is indicative of the femininity of Europe. So by favoring negotiation, persuasion, and diplomacy, Kagan suggested that Europe should metaphorically be conceived of as a woman, because this is what women do. The essay, of course, stirred up a lot of debate. So Per Kana, who was then a US fellow of the New America Foundation, he is an LSE PhD and a prolific policy analyst, he objected very strongly to the portrayal of diplomatic Europe as a woman. Right? So Kana suggests another metaphor for Europe in a 2004 foreign policy article that was entitled Europe, right, the Metrosexual Superpower. So Kana contends that Europe's way of being in the world better represents modern manhood than does the old fashioned US reliance on force. So in fact, although Europe engages in feminine behaviors and displays feminine characteristics, this does not warrant equating Europe with a woman. And I'm gonna read from, from Kana's article where he writes, quote, 
The trend-setting male icons of the 21st century must combine the coercive strengths of Mars and the seductive vials of Venus. Put simply, metrosexual men are muscular but suave, confident yet image conscious, assertive yet clearly in touch with their feminine sides. By cleverly deploying both its hard power and its sensitive side, the European Union has become more effective and more attractive than the United States on the catwalk of diplomatic clout. Meet the real new Europe, the world's first metrosexual superpower. Which is nice because we don't really have to analyze much here. <laughs> There's no subtext, right? It's all written out. So anyways, Kana ends his essay by stating that, quote, Europe has revealed its true 21st century orientation. Just as metrosexuals are redefining masculinity, Europe is redefining old notions of power and influence. And his point is very clear, right? That Europe is better conceived as a metrosexual male than a woman, right? So then the question for us is, what are we to make of this, right? I mean, we could dismiss this as just kind of tongue-in-cheek banter. That's not representative of how diplomacy is understood and discussed more widely. But I argue that this exchange is but one instance, right, of a more widespread practice in the US of discourse feminizing diplomacy. So I use the concept of feminization here simply to mean representing a person, institution, or object as having so-called feminine or allegedly feminine traits, right, skills or practices. So to be clear, I'm not arguing that diplomacy is not also infused with scripts of masculinity. It is, right? There's plenty of evidence of that. But what I claim here is instead that mas the masculine standing of diplomacy and the diplomat is unstable and it's susceptible to feminization, right? So the diplomat, so to speak, as a gendered subject, this alternates, right? So we see it slipping, sliding, changing form between, right, a woman, uh, an effete man, a lesser man, right, and back and forth, which is surprising in a sense, right, given the male kind of dominance of diplomacy as an institution. So diplomacy may be particularly prone to feminization in periods and contexts of militarism in the US, right, such as right now when so many seem so enthralled with military power and there's a sidelining of the State Department and the use of, of, of diplomacy. So then, feminization is seen as something, I mean, the feminine is something negative and you use feminization to degrade a practice that you, you don't agree with, right? But my sense is nonetheless that the feminization of diplomacy in the US gains much force, right, from discourses that are in wider international circulation. So I think there's a transnational subtext here on diplomacy, which is highly gendered, right? I don't think this is limited to the United States, even though it might be played out differently in the UK or in Sweden or elsewhere, right? But the discursive material that makes possible the identification of diplomacy as female, effeminate, or not quite male, probably extends beyond the US borders, in short. So what then is it that makes diplomacy susceptible to feminization? And in what ways has it been feminized in US discourse? Well, I think there are at least four interrelated factors. Let's see how much time we have. I'll be very quick here. One of them is pretty obvious, right? That diplomacy is often presented as the alternative to military force, right? That there are all these dualisms, right? That there's war, there's diplomacy, right? There's war and peace. There's hard power, there's soft power. And they're very easily align themselves with gender binaries, right? That women become associated with soft power, men with hard power, and so forth, right? So it's easy to make these things align. And we see this quite often. So I'm not going to linger on this too long because I think this is a pretty obvious point. And we can see a lot of this going on in foreign policy discussions, right? Of talking about diplomacy in this sense, as you know, one Trump uh, administrator said that is calling it like lace panty diplomacy or right, sissy diplomacy and all these sorts of right, like adjectives worse to kind of demean by feminizing diplomacy, right? And again, like talking about like sidelining the State Department as, you know, right, in this return to the hard power and the muscular foreign policy of, of the contemporary US, right? But then there are other pieces, I think, of diplomacy that serves the same end, right? And that is, for instance, that diplomacy, the essence of diplomacy is negotiation, right? So communication, negotiation, using relations for information gathering is absolutely central to what diplomats do. Right? 
And in many places, right, conversations and the use of language are widely understood and represented in gendered terms, right? So there are all kinds of ideas about men, how men use language and how women use language. That women supposedly are better about establishing connections, negotiating relationships, they're more empathetic, they're right, more interactive, and so forth. They're also represented as more talkative and more gossipy. Right? And gossip is very important to good diplomats. You need to have your ear on the gossip. Right? So as I was trying to Google an image of gossip, it's very high, hard to find an image that is of men gossiping. <laughs> if you look at Google images, it's all women whispering. Right? So there's gossip itself is a gendered, I mean, we understand it in gendered terms. Right? So we even see this, you know, I mean, or not surprising, I think there are those who draw connections then between the nature of diplomatic work and the allegedly superior conversation skills of women. Right? So when we see in the WikiLeaks, um, the dump of cables coming out of WikiLeaks, there was a lot of disparaging, like in, when people were reading like what diplomats, the cables that they were sending. So a lot of disparaging commentaries. This is all they do, right? It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of women gossiping, that kind of language, right? Talking about what it is that diplomats do. But you also see here that some of the women that are in diplomacy take this to make an argument for why they're actually better diplomats than their male colleagues. So we don't, it's not just a way of disparaging. It can also be used by women, right, strategically to argue that they're in fact better positioned as diplomats. So was, last year when I was doing interviews in DC, for instance, I talked to Barbara Bodine, who's a former US ambassador, and she expressed these ideas very, very clearly. So I'm just gonna read a quote from her when she explains why this is what diplomacy is, and in her terms, women then are better at this than men are. So she says, okay, so diplomacy is the art of building relationships to deal with issues that you don't even know you're going to have. There's a lot of time spent talking with people, not necessarily on what the issue is. It's not always transactional. Women, I think, we're more comfortable with nonlinear conversations. We're more comfortable in trying to get to know the person that we're dealing with. Tell me about your wife, your kids, the dog kind of conversation. We tend to deal more holistically with the people that we work with and we're more comfortable with that. And to a certain extent, we're more emp empathetic or we're more comfortable being empathetic. And so a lot of these skills that we have translate almost perfectly into diplomacy, she says. And then you add to, to that that we're as smart, if not smarter than our male colleagues. So my point of view, and then she laughs as she says this, always was, I have every advantage that you have. I'm just as smart as you are. I'm just as educated as you are. I can write as well as you can. I can come up with policy. So I've got all the intellectual skills that you've got. Plus, I have personal skills that you really don't, or you don't have them as naturally as I do, end of quote. So we see this reproduced among the diplomats themselves, right? As a way of here, the feminine is not de denigrated, rather, but rather upheld. It's like, this actually makes us women better, some, some women diplomats argue, right? Third, because I think I'm running out of time, diplomacy is essentially, in essence, also about representations, teas, dinners, events, right, food, also closely often associated with so-called women's work, right? None of this, again, I'm not essentializing these binaries, right? But rather, like, the, the, we can see that it overlaps, right? And finally, in the US, not least, diplomacy is feminized, and I kind of lump these together. It's this kind of fancy French and foreign thing that's antithetical to what a real American man is, right? This is not Texas steak, right? This is something, this institution is something else. And right, diplomacy obviously does have a French foundation. There are a lot of French terms used, right? There are French practices in it that's part of modern diplomacy, right? It remains an elite institution, white, male, and Yale. They often talk about, right, for the US, like the, the people that end up in diplomacy, right? So you have these pretty wealthy ambassadors, right, um, with the French foundation and the fact that it's very culturally upper class still, right? So all this means then, right, that it just opens itself up again to this kind of class-based feminization and denigration of, of diplomacy, right? In the US, French itself is often represented in gender terms with French depicted as a female language. There's a lot of scholarship on this already, 
right? And you might have followed when John Kerry, when he was running for president, like that was actually a disadvantage for him that he could speak French, right? Because it made him seem less manly, right? So there's also work done on this. Um, and this has been the case for a long time in the US. So George Kennan, you might know, he's a right, foreign policy strategist in the US, spelled this out quite clearly. He was lamenting the fact that the US, there are so many people that look down on diplomacy. He says in his words, right, like, quote, many Americans find this occupation unmanly, he says, right? And then he talks about the stuff, the speaking of French and the, right, the elite institutions and the attention to dress and so forth. And then if we go back to the question, to this image, this is the image that was used in foreign policy to depict the metrosexual superpower, right? The diplomat. I mean, look at that diplomat, right? I mean, here we have someone, right, that appears as some sort of European fop, right? Impeccably dressed in a fitted suit. He has an accentuated waist, pretty feminine curves in a sense, slick back blonde hair. Right, it's turned up nose. His general posture is very much one of arrogance, elitism, right? This is pretty far from the empathetic, caring, relational diplomat that we were talking about before. This diplomat radiates elitism and glamour, right? Eliciting both envy and scorn among those representing. So in sum then, I think when we're looking at like how diplomacy is, is represented in language, right? It is masculinized, but not stably so. Right? There are all kinds of ways in which feminization figures into the, the, like what the diplomat is made to be and what diplomacy is made to be. Right? And we need to ask questions about the diplomat kind of as a moving subject in gender terms. I think we're running out of time. So I'm just going to say a few things then about the gendered networks. So the next piece um, of this project has to do with the networks, the interactions, and the practices and what those look like. Generally, Networks, they're central to what diplomats do, right? You establish networks, and those networks are often permeated by international hierarchies. It's very hard for kind of weak or powerless states to be part of established networks with the, the core kind of wealthy, powerful states of the world, okay? And there are all kinds of coalitions between so-called like-minded states. The Caribbean states tend to meet together, the Nordic states have their meetings and so forth, right? So these are kind of the geopolitical realities of international affairs shaping what diplomatic interactions look like. And here I think it's very interesting to note that there are lots of sites. DC has it, uh, Vienna, Oslo, the Vatican, and Lisbon, lots of places. There are women network, there's women diplomats networks. So official networks consisting of women ambassadors or women di diplomats more widely, where they meet regularly, they share information, they help each other strategize, and that cuts, cuts across all of these international hierarchies, right? So what I'm doing now is trying to figure out more in terms of what are these, what are they responding to? What is it that gives rise to the idea that you should have a network of women ambassadors or a network of, of women uh, diplomats more broadly, right? And what is it that they do, right? Because this is something that's not well accounted for in the scholarship of international relations or the scholarship of diplomacy. So that's a very interesting kind of set of interactions. Um, and it suggests that gender matters, right? Because the women are obviously responding to something and they're obviously doing something. And then the final piece also has then the fourth part of what Acker was talking about is identities, and how they're at work, which has to do here, what I'm looking at is the management of femininities and masculinities by diplomats. So this entails drilling into the performance of gender through the use of clothes, shoes, bags, jewelry, hairdo, so forth. Might seem trivial, but it takes a lot of work, right? It takes work if there are really strict professional norms that your hair has to look a certain way. It takes work to, right, to, to dress, to hide your curves or show your curves in a particular way, or to discipline your body to have to meet certain slimness, fitness kind of criteria that are among ambassadors clearly, right? It takes work to sit on a stage in a skirt and make sure that the journalists don't get like a photograph up your, up your skirt, right? And of your underwear, as one ambassador explained to me. There's a lot of tiny little things here that go into performing, right, as a, as a male or female diplomat. And then there's the question how men and women maneuver and 
right, strategize around these things. Um, there are ways in which some ambassador talked about that, that they use this to their advantage, right? There might be expectations, for instance, that women don't quite understand as much or know as much, which several ambassadors have told me they use strategically all the time when they interact with male counterparts, pretending to be stupid, putting their head on the, asking dumb questions. And that way you elicit a lot more information than that person that your counterpart should have given you, right? So there are ways in which you can use, strategize, and maneuver through this, which is part of what we're looking at in this piece of the, of the, of the project. Um, also, there are ways in which you can use clothes to be seen. I'm sure you've read somewhere, at least heard of Madeline all by using her pins to signal things. But there's also, you know, using dress, right? Like most diplomats are men. Most of them wear suits. It's hard to stand out, right? Whereas if you're wearing a bright red dress, you're, sh you're very visible, right? And for a U.S. ambassador, for instance, where everybody at an event needs to know that the U.S. ambassador was there, you have to make a showing, it's very important. If you're very visible, right, you come in, people see you, and you can go out the back door 10 minutes later and everyone knew you were there, right? So there are ways in which, again, it might seem trivial, but I think if we drill into this and see all the labor it takes and add it with the other stuff, Right? It is part of this institution. Here I will end. Just to say again, I think piecing all these things together, asking questions about all this stuff simultaneously is what we need to understand how gender works in diplomacy. Thank you very much. Continue the discussion over a glass. Marissa. Awesome. Um, okay, I'll make it speedy so we can get to the wine quickly. Um, so before I kind of dive into my commentary on what Anne was talking about very excellently, might I add, um, I just kind of want to frame my perspective on where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm the co-founder and UK director of the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy. Um, I founded it a little over two years ago when I was fresh out of my master's from SOAS. Um, so I am a really big nerd about feminist foreign policy. This is the thing I get most excited about. Um, and I think just kind of really quickly to define it and just share um, my understanding of it and kind of then how like gender and diplomacy falls under this, this umbrella. Um, so the best way I really found to describe it is as like people-centered policy. Because ultimately, that's really what it boils down to is um, making sure that people affected by policy are included in the policy-making process, and then making sure that policy outputs um, are centered around what their potential impact will be on people. Um, so I think in general, like IR, as we all probably know is very, very abstracted. It's um, just got a lot of realist thinking in it. So um, there is this tendency to kind of lose track of the human consequence of foreign policy a lot of the time um, and, and make this connection between the local and the global. Um, and, you know, I think too that like gender equality is a really big part of feminist foreign policy, but it's sort of one part of it and there really needs to be a very intersectional understanding of what feminism is to have a true feminist foreign policy um, and to really kind of actively undo this, this systemic racism. And, you know, in the UK, obviously, we see this so strongly with um, colonial legacies. Um, so let's see, I'll, I'll skip through this to get to the end. Um, so, so we've got a couple different projects with uh, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy to kind of help ground this really big picture kind of overarching ideology into um, practice, into something a little bit more tangible. So for us, kind of the things that we're looking at specifically in the UK right now um, involve um, eliminating nuclear weapons, ending indefinite detention of 
immigrants, and then also involving more women in political leadership. So this fits very nicely with what Anne was talking about. Um, I think it's not really possible to produce effective foreign policy if it's only coming from a really specific, very elite pool of people who are reproducing their own thought patterns um, and aren't allowing kind of any new or different perspectives into what they're doing. Um, so in this sense, it is just incredibly important just on that basis alone to, to try and have um, more diverse representation of the population mirrored in political leadership. Um, and, you know, foreign policy and diplomacy, it's, it is this very kind of external role where you go and you um, represent your state's needs and interests to other people. So to, and, and it's not a democratic process either. Um, so to have, uh, again, like a very specific group of people representing this and making kind of judgments based off of their own lived experiences just does a real disservice actually to kind of crafting state to state relationships. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, this, this kind of nepotism again, just keeps um, this particular group think, um, and if I'm American, if you can tell by my accent, and I've lived in the UK for about four years now, and I feel like this is a really big part of the reason why we keep seeing um, just this, this really realist way of thinking, these really um, kind of nefarious, toxic, hegemonic, masculine principles in foreign policy making. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's really important to note, as Anne has, has pointed out, rightfully so, that there is a really big danger in looking at foreign policy from this, like, male versus female binary. That said, I do think it's also completely okay to, like, have a conversation around including more women in, in diplomacy and foreign policy um, and making the space for that conversation, but obviously not at the expense of other conversations as well. Um, but then this is also why speaking about kind of gendered traits and the expectations of how kind of gender is performed and the different ways that gender um, influences how we understand foreign policy is and power more generally is, is really, really critical. Um, so my, my own personal area of research is, is around um, masculinity and nuclear policy. And you know, this is an area that, uh, that really strongly relies on diplomacy and is also just incredibly male-dominated. Um, the male pale stale Yale phrase. Um, so within nuclear policy, I've looked at kind of how these um, gendered characteristics are ascribed to specific gender identities. And these traits are then used to inform um, the way we are expected to behave based on our own gender identity, of course, um, which informs life experiences and decision making. And if you're in a position where you're making policy, that has a direct impact on what you have as an output, how you make policy, and how it affects other people. So, you know, and I, I think we're at SOAS, we can all agree that just because you're of a certain gender identity doesn't mean you're going to have these specific gender traits. Uh, we all know this is, this is completely a construct and is in desperate need of, of interruption. Um, and this is why, you know, I get annoyed when people start talking about how, and I've definitely heard this too with my work, where men are just better at dealing with hard security. You know, it's just throughout history, um, we have formulated this perception that hard security needs these more masculine traits to be successful, whatever successful means, you know, preventing war or keeping peace um, at the on the basis of the threat of violence, by the way. Um, so, so I think this is where Anne's work has, has really been just like amazing and, and really groundbreaking in a lot of ways because it just reminds us that this is a very manufactured pattern. This is not objective fact. Um, diplomacy is better when there are more people involved. And I think one of the kind of phrases that has really stuck with me is this idea of power and prestige and, and kind of what her work talks about is, um, you know, saying that men tend to be over overrepresented in positions characterized by power and prestige which then influence societal perception of what power and prestige looks like. 
So it's this very self-fulfilling kind of prophecy. Um, and also reminds me of the phrase, you can't be what you can't see. So I think purely by including, uh, just simply including more women in diplomacy, we already begin to interrupt this idea of like what power even looks like to begin with. Um, so yeah, I think you know understanding where um, male and female diplomats are, kind of looking at the pipeline to ambassadorships, how that might be leaking, is also really critical to understanding how um, how women are meaningfully included in diplomacy. So obviously, you know, we've got the the statistic of having 85% of ambassadorships be uh, having been held by men, um, but we know at the same time there does tend to be, I think it was close to a 50-50 um, ratio of, of men and women going into like the foreign policy or diplomacy fields here in the UK, but somewhere along the way, women fall out of that route to an ambassadorship. And I think we really need to be hyper critical of why this is happening, how it's happening and how we can, can really address this. Um, Cause there is just a very, very clear glass ceiling here. Um, and diplomacy is just a really core part of foreign policy um, and it in some ways does represent this other side to the coin of um, the more traditional militarized approach to security, which is really based on this threat of violence. So looking at how gender comes into play with diplomacy um, is just an absolute necessary thing to um, to crack that glass ceiling and really truly start to make foreign policy a more feminist space. Um, yeah, I'll end there. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Well, uh, thank you, audience, for your patience. The floor is now yours. That's... Gentlemen, right at the back. If I can issue the listening, please to say who you are and <laughs> make your question short and sharp. Okay, thank you. Uh, my, my name is Ali. I'm affiliate of London University Institute. I'm, I'm regular here, more or less part of the furniture, as they say. Uh, uh, thank you for speaking in plain English with hardly any jargon. And you came across loud and clear. Uh, my question is, uh, do you have any figure breakdown of uh, representation of women ambassadors or diplomats from the block of 50, I believe at least 55, I stand to be corrected in figures, 55 Muslim states, which includes 22 Arab states out of, again, I think it's 196 member states of the UN. Do you have any figure breakdown uh, of that? And thank you again. Thanks. We'll take a, a couple of questions, I think. I'll take one down the front. Anybody else in the wings and one in the middle after? First of all, thank you very much for your presentation. My name is Blanca. I used to study at CISD, a master's in energy and climate policy a couple of years ago. And I was one of the um, first members of the Center for Women's Empowerment that we created in CISD. One of the things that we started doing in the, in the center was trying to look at the different things that we consider were not wrong or had a gap between what we would like them to be and what they were in terms of uh, lectures, in terms of students, of text. And we try to tackle, for example, the amount of um, readings that we were exposed to that were created by male and women. We tried to do some research. We tried to put some pressure internally as I'm placed by remember, um, on trying to, to adjust that. Also, based on my personal experience, I've seen how um, the undergraduate for international relations was a degree for, for girls, and then it was a career for men. And there, were, there are many gaps like that that I could spot on. So based on your experience as researchers, what kind of things can be fixed or can change at the ground level of universities to make sure that people who have those masters and those programs get to those positions of being ambassadors of countries. Thank you. Great, that's a great couple. Take, maybe we'll take those two. Good, uh, good balanced questions. Do you want to start now? Sure. Uh, 
and I, I hate this already, that two really interesting questions. I unfortunately don't have data on the on Muslim Muslim majority countries, but that's data we could very easily put together. And I think having your question now, I think that I will go back and ask my group to do that. <laughs> so I think that that would be very interesting. What I do know is that there is work in a number of Muslim states, right, or Islamic states, to increase the number of women ambassadors like you know again um i think i think morocco i don't want to be wrong now but i think morocco has an active program to recruit more women into diplomacy uh united arab emirates does right and again as i said before the you know 30 percent of the women ambassadors that are in dc are from muslim majority countries so it's not as if right there's not momentum and movement right in that block of states I just, I wish I had the data to, to give you, and I don't right now, but I will go and, and take a look. Um, and then the second question was really interesting about, so if I understand you right, like what should be done at the university level to make sure that more women go into the diplomatic career and then end up ambassadors? Okay, the, that's a huge question. I think, um, I don't, I mean, I think it depends on where you're located in the world, obviously, but I think in the UK, or, for instance, I don't think there's a lack of applicants, right? So you have a lot of women that go into diplomacy, so I don't think that's an issue in itself. I think the question is rather, and here I don't have the answers, but I think the question is, again, like, what does that pipeline look like? Is it a leaky career pipeline or is it a tight career pipeline? Because if, if it leaks women along the way, they're not gonna end up as ambassadors, right? And things that seem to affect this, it's a range of stuff, but what kind of provisions are there? You know, still w women take more responsibility often for the family, which is not, you know, that's not set in stone, but sociologically, that's what it looks like, right? So it seems that ministries of foreign affairs, would, they have better, you know, family leave provisions that kind of accommodate for, you know, children and that sort of thing. Women tend to do better in those ministries of foreign affairs than those where there's absolutely nothing, right? So that's one thing, for instance. You also have to make sure that you have that you have a ministry for foreign affairs that has to, that follow up on things like salary disparities or what the mentorship programs look like, what kind of networks you have that you know, like what does career uh, development look like within that Ministry for Foreign Affairs and what things are central, right? And are those central things gendered in a way that disadvantages women or not, right? What that looks like in the UK, I don't know exactly, right? But I, I would say that those are the most, you know, that you have to get a, a good grip on, on the institution itself. So it's not so much getting there anymore as it is what's going on inside. And again, it does unfortunately seem like the whole, you know, family leave, that piece seems one big piece of the puzzle as long as women are primary parents. Right. Yeah, um, I think, <laughs> that's loud, uh, totally agree with what you're saying. I think there, you know, the responsibility really is on, is on governments to make sure that they're, um, their pathways to ambassadorships are achievable for everybody that wants it. Um, and that there are built-in systems to help people um, who, who have families or children, whatever. Um, unfortunately, the only things I can think of sort of like short-term are much more like upon the individual rather than like an institutional thing, but there are really fantastic resources. Um, like. Uh, women in Foreign Policy is a website where they do interviews with a bunch of, of women in foreign policy. Um, so I think more and more so I do see this recognition of um, a lot of my female colleagues to just really kind of um, make sure that other younger women have as many open doors as possible. So I, I am seeing a lot more uh, resources in that regard just to like learn how to have a career in foreign policy or diplomacy. Um, and understand like what skill sets are needed. Uh, but yeah, like I agree, I think the bottleneck is really the, the government in that sense, yeah. Okay, let's take a few more. There's uh, in, the, in the middle there, uh, that's it. But it's behind you, in the, in that, there you go. Yep. Okay. Oh, hello, um, I'm Yu Chen Zhang. I'm currently studying political science in UCL. Uh, 
I worked uh, uh, a little bit before the program as journalist. Uh, as far as I know, uh, I think the statistics need to be updated. So it's uh, uh, half a question, half a confirmation. I got a couple of years ago, actually, 25% uh, of diplomats that diplomats in the world are female. I, I don't know if it's a regional statistic or it's uh, worldwide. Uh, but in my country, I'm from China. In my country, UK and New Zealand ambassador in my country are actually female, and a couple of uh, um, ambassador from Latin American countries are also female. So um, I think uh, I think some of them uh, have the connection with the country even before they took the position. So uh, my question could be. Uh, is it possible that they, they are uh, selected as a ambassador in a certain country is uh, expertise based because it has a language uh, um, advantage and had, they had a, a connection with the country or society. And also I know uh, UK also has their female ambassadors in Ukraine and in Mongolia. So uh, both of them can speak multiple languages. Mm -hmm. So could it be, um, correlated with the uh, increased level of uh, women involvement in the politics. Thanks, we'll take one there. And, sorry? There is. Okay. <laughs> Last question, then, we'll be, then I'm afraid we're going to have to move. Okay, I'll be very quick. My name is Laura. I work in comms at the International Growth Center at LSE. In recent years, we have seen a rise in digital diplomacy. How do you think this will impact your ongoing research on areas and questions such as identities and relations? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we'll, we'll go up one minute. But both of them will happily chat at the reception afterwards, which is upstairs. Okay, so do I respond or do we wait? I didn't I understand think just, it. You have a minute. A minute, okay, so very quickly. Um, it might be that there are 25% female diplomats now. I'm looking at ambassadors, which is at the top level, and I, I doubt that there are 25% ambassadors today, but there might be. And yes, I do think ex language expertise might matter in some cases. Japan, for instance, and their delegations to the UN is 60% female, even though that's their prime foreign policy arena, and we, which we think is a language selection. Okay. Leave it there? Thanks. Okay. <laughs> My two cents is that I'm from the US, I'm very cynical, regional knowledge doesn't help you because it's a very nepotistic way of appointing ambassadors. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs>